This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 125. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode number 125 of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I am the founder of L3 Leadership. We are a leadership development company devoted to helping you become the best leader that you can be. If you're new to this podcast, we're committed to bringing you three new episodes every single month. One will always be a leadership talk from our events that we host. One will be an interview with I do with a high-level leader, and then once a month, you'll get a personal leadership lesson by me. If you've been listening for a while, I'd really appreciate if you would hop on iTunes or whatever you use to listen to this and subscribe and leave a rating and review. Uh, That really helps us grow our audience, and I would appreciate that. In this specific episode, you're going to get to hear our question and answer session with Dan Dupee. Dan Dupee is the board chair of the CCO, which is a large college ministry. They're responsible for raising over $12 million a year. Um, They have over 250 employees. And what I love about Dan is he just recently handed off the organization to his his successor. And uh, Dan led the organization for many, many years. And uh, not only did he do a phenomenal job growing that ministry, uh, but he also raised up his successor and handed off the reins and it's been a smooth transition and everything's going well. Um, So that speaks so much to his leadership and I'm just super impressed by Dan and the work that he's doing. And you're going to love the Q&A session. If you didn't get a chance to listen to Dan's talk, um, go back to episode number 124 of the L3 Leadership Podcast and you can listen to him talk about the culture that they created and how they created culture at the CCO. But before we jump in uh, to Dan's talk, uh, I also want to mention that Dan recently wrote a book called It's Not Too Late. It's a book for parents, and uh, I really encourage you to get a copy of this book, whether you are a parent or you want to be a parent. Um, If you are a parent, it's really going to help you. Um, If you want to be a parent, it's going to help shape how you parent one day in the future. And so um, you can go to this website and check it out at ccojubilee.org forward slash not too late and learn more about that. And I'll also include a link to that in the show notes. And then lastly, I want to thank our sponsor, Bab Inc. Uh, They are an insurance broker, third-party administrator, and consulting firm in Pennsylvania and all across the country. They host our monthly leadership breakfasts uh, at their beautiful building in Pittsburgh, and uh, I'm just so grateful for my friend Russell Livingston, who runs the company. Uh, he He's really passionate about developing next generation leaders and uh, really does a lot for L3 to help us do that. So thank you guys at BAB, and if you want to learn more about them, you can go to babbins.com. That's B-A-B-B-I-N-S.com. With that being said, let's just jump right into the Q&A, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Yeah, so um, I guess my question is, Let's say you're in the scenario of a leader, yet either laterally or even above you, there are leaders that you're just really wrestling with and the culture they perpetuate that's toxic and the gratitude they really seem uh, vapid of. Um, And they may be great at what they do specifically, but when it comes to cultivating people around them, that's just not there. How do you, um, I mean, does it require sort of managing up? And uh, how do you apply these principles laterally or above you when you're in leadership? Yeah, that's a good, uh, good question, Michael. The, so you're not, you're not the person that gets to call the shots for the entire entity. There are people above you, people beside you, and you have to lead in the context of working with them. And they may be on a different page with values and, you know, with culturally. And I think the uh, so first is to acknowledge that's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, place to be. It's not an easy thing to do, um, because you you have to you have to do two things that are in tension with each other. One is you have to you have to be able to, with integrity, express all the things I talked about. If you believe those things are true, you got to embody them, and you may have to you may have to swim upstream to do it. So there may not be a great deal of reinforcement to the things, you know, like how conflict gets handled, for example, may not be the way I describe it. Uh, But you'll need to do it that way with the understanding that you're not going to know what the impact's going to be laterally or, or above you and still find a way to respectfully acknowledge the authority of the person who's, who's above you. So, you know, one, one of my redos that I wish I, you know, if I had a redo, I'd like to have been a better follower. You know, uh, in the military, there's a book called The West Point Way of Leadership. You know, and the thinking behind how they do, and of course, you're Air Force, you're probably like, why would you want to learn anything from the Army? But, you know, that's the, the, uh, 
Uh, the West Point way of leadership, the thinking is um, to be a good leader, you've got to learn how to be a good follower first. And I wasn't always a good follower. So attending to the priorities of the person who's over you, you still have to do that. You have to be a good follower while expressing what you think is important in the way that you do what you do. There's a tension. And you probably, the whole time you're in that situation, that tension will exist. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm an independent filmmaker. My question was about how you said you want to lead by example and uh, create a culture of people who solve problems by handling problems yourself. How do you do that without becoming the person who has to always solve the problems? How do you like inspire other people yeah. to solve problems? Yeah, there's it could happen if you, if if you know if people aren't just automatically running out there and going, "Hey, I'll I'll take this one for you, Dan." Um, you may need to set them up to do the work. Uh, so what it sounds like is this: Hey, um, you know, typically you've seen me handle some problems and difficulties around here. Uh, but I'm pretty committed to you learning and growing. This one's going to be yours. This one's going to be yours. I mean, that that's, sets the table, and then you, and then you, you know, kind of set the parameters uh, that allows them access to you as they walk through the problem. But you fundamentally, as you're doing that, want to keep the ball in the other person's court and give them a chance. Uh, give, them a, give them a turn at bat. It's, it'll be one of the, it's a gift. One of, the, one of the best ways for them to grow as a leader is for you to let them handle a thorny issue with you walking with them. Yeah. Anyone else questions? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, I had a question about, you were talking about the conversation that you had with Vince in regards to the implicit to explicit, yeah. um, I think like values of the culture or how to, how to do that. Could you maybe expand on that conversation a little bit more of uh, what that was about and how you were able to, um, how to go about doing that? Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting because uh, this was a case of Vince actually coaching me. This is a couple years ago. And it had to do with uh, a couple folks who were working with us. And what he was seeing that I was missing is that we didn't have a cultural fit. And it was really rooted in a need that I had to address my own leadership blind spot. You know, help me, help me understand what this looks like because I, I'm missing these things. And so we, we really, there was nothing genius about the conversation it was we we kind of brainstormed our way through uh you know and it was in this case it was me asking somebody who got it a bunch of questions so that that would be you know somebody in a team generally is they've got the information here it just needs to come out of here and that's what that's what we needed at that that's what i needed at that moment because i needed to get clear so i was asking a lot of questions and doing some discovery and, and I would, by the way, when you're doing something like this, I commend to you what I call a first draft culture. You know, writing a book, you need to buy my book. <laughs> I wasn't very subliminal. Uh, right? It's a really good book. Writing, writing a book, uh, one of the things you learn is you, you, can't, you can't simultaneously create and edit. You know, you got to, you, you, the job of a first draft is just to get it down. And so the, in an exercise like this, I think what Vince and I did was, the job was, let's just get stuff out there. And then we can edit it later if we don't, if we decide, well, that's not really part of our culture. But in that kind of exercise, having the freedom to just start getting some, find the person you think embodies it and can articulate it, ask them a bunch of questions and start getting it down. Next question. Randy? I'm Randy. I'm a, a financial advisor. Um, and I'm going to throw you a softball here. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Just what you're trying to yeah. you know, teach us or what you want people to learn through it and you know, why we should read it? Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I really am well, curious. Well-thrown <laughs> softball, my man. 
uh, yeah, the book, the, 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 I think I alluded to what caused me to write the book, which is the number of kids, number of young people who walk away from their faith during college. The data is what led me to write a parenting book because the data, the best data says that he, during the teenage years, despite all signs to the contrary, parents are still the most influential people in the life of a young person. So the, the thing that I saw, I can remember having breakfast with a friend in the North Side whose son was at a school in North Carolina and asking him, hey, how's, uh, is he plugged into any kind of support a Christian fellowship, a church, a Bible study. And the dad uh, is like, well, no. You know, kind of like, why would he do that? And why would I ask him to do that? And, you know, it was so apparent at that moment that that dad had given away a significant amount of the influence he had with his son. I mean, most young people are looking to their parents and looking to other influential adults, which is the biggest surprise of doing the book. The role of other influential adults, mentors, in the life of a kid is huge. It's absolutely huge. It's, it's in the top six list of things that really makes a difference. Um, knowing that, it's sort of like, well, uh, we've got people who could have an influence with kids, with their own kids that aren't. So the book, what the book does, it looks at the, some of the mythology that causes the problem, gets down to what, what's really true based on research, based on some other things, experience we have working with young people. And then I get really practical. I do, you know, the kind of conversation that we had uh, with some of the questions where I'm actually giving you almost like, here's what the conversation would sound like to talk to your son who doesn't want to go to, the, to his youth group anymore. So that's the, that's the, that's the deal with the book. It, it's a, it's a, it really is a game changer. You, you have, if you have... Uh, if you're starting a family, if you have if you're uh, if you have nieces or nephews, um, or if you're volunteering in some capacity with young people, I'd say it's a must. I really I feel strongly about it. Yeah. And, and I was going to back up and sell that as far as personal growth, because a lot of you may not have kids yet and be in that season of life. Um, so with your growth, in my opinion, you're either going to be proactive or reactive. Hmm. And in your twenties, I. And this is just me. So, like, I wanted, I wanted to have a vision and values of what a great marriage would look like before I married Laura, right? I don't want to try to figure that out once we're married. That's bad, right? That would be reactive. So, this is a perfect opportunity in getting around people like Dan to be proactive in your growth and getting a vision and values for what you want when you're a parent. Um, I find too many people find themselves hitting rock bottom. And they find themselves in an emergency situation, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I need to read a book." Then they try to read a book. And then they read and they're like, oh my gosh, I should have been doing this 20 years ago. Right? And, and the, the worst time to be essential like good is in the midst of an emergency. You have to be. Um, so I just want to encourage you, if you're saying, well, I don't have kids yet, start shaping what you want your family to look like now. Start shaping what you want your marriage to look like now. It's extremely important. So That's a good word. And they're not uh, selling books, so I expect all of them to go like hotcakes. <laughs> Alright, next question. So Dan, I think every single person in here has a has a crazy passion for growth and for achieving goals. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, how have how have you practically kept priorities straight, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with your faith, family, mm -hmm. friends, and and also knowing that work is an outflowing of who we are, yeah. um, not allowing the goals to get in the way of who we are and our priorities. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, because, uh, you know, the thing about my 17-year tenure and very similar to what, uh, what, what Vince is experiencing now is it, 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 it was when our, you know, we, I started when our girls were three. We have two sets of twins. So when you hear people, hey, you have four kids, but you only, you know, I'm not, I love them all. I'm not leaving anybody's birth date out. Uh, when our, I started as president when our girls were three and our, our guys were uh, seven. And so these are pretty intense years of investment in family. And, uh, and I'm glad you used the word priorities. Uh, you know, there's something called time management, which I've always found to be interesting because I've never figured out how to manage time. It sort of is what it is. You know, it's, we got 24 hours and there you have it. Leaders learn to manage priorities. 
leaders have to work out of uh, a, a defined set of priorities. And a couple words on on how you do that and uh, how you do it relative to goals. It's I think it's really good to have goals. And uh, those of you who are kind of experimenting with writing some stuff down, you know, this is a very intentional guy over here, and he could probably help you. Um, this is back to the first draft thing. Goals are hard to write. And I think you're better off revising them every month than you are getting a perfect goal that you don't look at for a year. I used to have journal entries, January 1st, 1985. January 1st, 19, that would be my journal, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> That's not right. That's not how you do it. So, so it's good to be explicit about the goals. You need to think in terms of priorities. Here's the thing as far as getting that stuff right if all of your goals are, are expressions of what you're doing in your work and none of your goals are germane to your family or your relationships, you'll get after, you'll get after, you'll get after work really hard and you won't, not, you won't necessarily act with great intentionality around your family or around other priorities. So this, whatever it is, a mistake we make, work lends itself, especially in, in business, but in other, other spheres, work lends itself to accountability, to getting things done, to really, you know, really going somewhere. And so you tend to be more explicit about your goals and work. You need to get explicit about them in other areas. So for me, Brian, month by month, I track, I mean, I'm, I've shown people the system I use. They usually just look at it and go, you're out of your mind. I'm not going to do that. But I tracked it. There were eight things every month I kept, kept track of. And four of them related directly to my work and four of them related to, to other stuff. Uh, and my wife used, what's that? Well, they changed from month to month. But, you know, the work ones were usually around fundraising, around leadership. And, and they, were, they were around things. They were what those of you who do the work you do, you know, you're looking, you're looking for what we'll call upstream behaviors or leading indicators. So if you're measuring how much money, you, you have to raise money in the work that we do. And the problem is, is by the time you figure out, you, you do that for a living. By the time you figure out what you've done in a given month, you can't have any impact on that month. But if you're measuring something like how many appointments you have or, you know, how many phone calls you're making, you know, that's, that's a leading indicator. So leading indicators are nice to do. And then the, the personal ones were always time alone with God, time with my family, and then something like exercise. Or My worst one, by the way, the one I failed with, if, if I had to score my, was always what I was eating because I was never getting that one right. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah. So, so follow up to that. So you fundraise for a living. I think we've got budgets around 10 million. About twelve million. Twelve million. Yeah. That's a lot. Anyway, that's pretty impressive. But I think the two million matters. I mean, it's oh, it's, it's huge, a, it's amazing. Um, but you've built a really impressive board over however long you were at the CCO. You've been interacting with tons of Pittsburgh's best leaders. Can you just talk about networking uh, for your professionals and what you've even noticed? I mean, one reason we train leaders like you is we. Love, I find that leaders like you want to mentor people that are in this room and vice versa. Do you see that in the leaders that you spend time with? And if so. How can the people in this room be intentional about building relationships with potential mentors like that? Yeah, the the uh, what what has worked well for me in in you know it's fun. Yesterday I had a friend and mentor and former board member call me from North Carolina, who I talk to about once a year. Just a reminder of the, the rich resources that are available in our community. I think the 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 networking. Um, uh, ha having something, uh, it's it's most useful to now. I'm kind of getting on the other end of this thing um, as somebody who's a little bit older with more experience. Uh, it's most useful to have something particular you want to find out when you sit in front of somebody and you're networking. So having a question, I've seen you do this really well. You know, having a question or a couple questions, things that are floating around in your mind that you'd really like to know, and. Uh, I think the best way to engage that conversation uh, with folks, I mean, first of all, is to get in front of them and ask them, hey, could we sit down and have a cup of coffee or have lunch? You're probably going to have to ask them more than once because the chances are they get asked by a lot of people, hey, could we sit down and have a cup of coffee and have lunch? And they're looking. You know what they're looking to find out? You serious? 
Or is this kind of like a convenient moment for you to ask me this question and I'll never hear from you again? You know, you probably have to ask them two or three times. And then by then, you can get a little bit more particular. I've got a couple, you know, I've got one person who's really hard to access. Uh, I know him, we have a good relationship, but he, you know, he ran the big, biggest business there was to run in Pittsburgh for years. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, so getting on his schedule is not an easy thing. I just told him, you know, I'm going to periodically have a leadership question I want to ask you. Can we, can I do it? And he said, sure. So having something particular and just start off with one. Don't start off saying, can we meet every week? You know, start off with one time, see how it goes. And if you feel like, hey, uh, you know, I'm really getting a lot out of this. Would it be okay to get together again? Does that get at that? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, my name's Chris, and um, I I work in the assisted living field as the activities director. But my passion really is um, working with at-risk youth, and I'm a youth leader and in the performing arts area. And I wow. would like to eventually have um, a theater company that's Christian-based and really ministers to kids, you know, in, in their healing process and finding their voice and expressing themselves. Do you have wisdom to share with um, surrounding working to have an income, trying to launch a ministry, and just the balance of it all? Yeah, and, and I, my wisdom to share is to talk to somebody like this, or uh, uh, because I, uh, I haven't, you know, the first would just be, a, I haven't done what you're looking to do. I haven't simultaneously done one job while I'm, while I'm trying to launch something else. Um, so um, I'm thinking that's going to be really good and really hard. Uh, it's not going to be an easy thing to pull off. I would assume, i, I tell you what I saw when I came in here this morning. Um, I saw a team. So I think, uh, I think you're going to be pushing water uphill with a squeegee until you get some people around you who share a common vision. I think it needs to be a we thing, not an I thing. That'd be my, the sum total of my wisdom, such that it is. Hi, Dan. Uh, thank you for your great talk this morning. A lot of great takeaways. Um, one thing you touched on that I have a question about is forgiveness. Uh, you gave a great example about how to recognize when you need to ask for forgiveness and how to do that. Um, I was wondering if you could share any experience or strategy you might have for how to forgive someone else when they've hurt you or um, offended you in some way and you know, how you've processed that in your own life and if you could share an yeah. experience. Yeah, and that's a, I think, Paul, you're getting at one of the tougher things there is, when, particularly when somebody's uh, significantly damaged you. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I have not had very much of that in my life, but I've had, in the process of raising money, I had two circumstances, and they were <laughs> with church mission committees where I felt abused. Just uh, and 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 uh, it's a long story, I, you know, but you can tell it sticks with me. The wound can be scratched and opened right away. You know, I think the Jesus words relating his forgiveness of us and connecting it very directly to our forgiveness of other people. First of all, it tells me it's not an option. So I'm, I'm answering this as a Christian. You know, it's not an option. So I've got to, I've got to do it. Uh, but then the place that I've gone in these two situations and in others is Lord, I, I, I don't have the resources to do this. Uh, so trying to remember, uh, again, referring to my place in the world as a Christian, a core story for me is the story of the prodigal son. And in appropriate Christian theology and in my own walk, I'm the prodigal son, right? I'm the one who's been forgiven deeply. And as someone who's been forgiven deeply, uh, I've got something in me that I think can be released to forgive other people. Uh, so I think continuing to press into my own 
Uh, one of the things I learned from Brian works with a team of people, the Sandler sales group. And one of the things I learned from them was to, to in the process of journaling, journal some things about your own identity. And one of the things I journal every day is my own belovedness as one of God's children. And that belovedness comes by way of forgiveness. So I, I am not somebody who's got this thing figured out, but I know I'm not off the hook. And, uh, and if you, you know, if, you, if it's really, for some folks, they've experienced some pretty horrible things at the hands of other people, sometimes people in their own families. And I think it's worth doing whatever you got to do to get to that place. Because that bitterness will consume you. Uh, and if they're not, you know, people that ought to ask you to forgive them, sometimes they just don't do it. They don't see it, which I think is very hard. It's worth whatever you got to do to get there, though, I think. Yeah. Hi, Anthony here. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the one thing that you would have done different as a uh, as a leader would have been a better follower. What does that look like? What 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 some of the things that you would have done different as a follower? Excellent question. Because I think this, and this would be the very important thing. I think for folks in this room, particularly if you're. You know, if you're in your 20s or early 30s. Um, yeah, I, I think the... There's a, there's a, again, going back to my, to my most important point of reference, which is the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. There's a fascinating story in there of the parable of the stewards. You know, one guy gets a little bit of money to invest. One guy gets a decent amount. One guy gets a lot. And the two that get, the guy that gets a decent amount and the guy that gets a lot, they, they do a nice job of investing on behalf of the, of the owner. And the guy that just gets a little buries it in the ground. And you remember what he says? Why did, why did you bury my money in the ground? <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I was expecting you to do. And he, he says, well, I under, you're a hard man. You sow where you don't reap. You know? So he has a set of assumptions about the person that he's following they're pretty bad, and he behaves in a particular way as a consequence of his view and understanding of the person that he's following. And I think as a follower, um, y- you know, uh, checking your, uh, for me, what I would do differently, I'd pay a lot more attention to the priorities, wants, and needs of the person I was following. I'd want to, you know, what are, what are they trying to do? What's important to them? Um, and I'd be a lot more disciplined. Uh, I'd be a lot more disciplined about how I talked about my leader in front of other people. Um, I'd be a lot more disciplined about uh, even my own thoughts. I'd find a safe place. If I needed a lightning rod because my boss is driving me nuts, I'd find somebody I could talk to safely and confidentially. But I'd want to show up as the best follower that could be there. I wish, and, and you know, when I finally did learn to, to, to be a better follower, I was having a lot more fun. <laughs> I really was, because it was like released from thinking I'm always the smartest guy in the room to just figure out what this person wants and figure out a way to put my whole energy behind doing it. Uh, and don't be like that guy that buries the talent in the ground that assumes the worst about the person who's leading me. That's what I would do differently. That's so good. Uh, last question is just how can we serve you? And specifically, can you just talk about, we're going to talk about your book and that, but how can we serve you? And then you're, you're the portrait of CCO. Uh, and one of our goals, when we bring in nonprofit leaders or some of you guys that are nonprofits, uh, we want it to be an opportunity for you to get involved. We want that to be an opportunity for you to be generous with that nonprofit as well. So what are some ways that people listening can connect with the CCO uh, possibly be generous with them or get involved? Yeah, I think uh, connecting with the CCO, there are uh, a number of CCO friends in the room. And, uh, of course, our president, Vince Burens. Says, Vince, would you mind just putting up your hand so people know how to find you? Uh, an excellent man to talk to about the CCO. Vince is not only president, uh, but he was a student in a CCO ministry at the University of Pittsburgh. He knows... Uh, he knows the, in, the organization inside and out. Michael Thornhill, uh, right there, 
uh, also works for the CCO, and he is also uh, somebody who can tell you uh, a, a lot. And, and Dara uh, DeCellis uh, uh, and Kara Liberati right here, they, they can tell you a lot of stuff too. So you can connect with one of those folks. I think for us, um, uh, you know, we're, we're come to the Jubilee Conference in February. I don't know if you realize we're bringing Lecrae to town. And uh, that's that. That's not a bad thing, right? Uh, not, not, and, and the reason I would commend, I'm doing this for part for the CCO, but I'm doing it for you. Uh, you know, I, when I became a Christian, um, it was at the Jubilee Conference, and Jubilee is where you go deeper into understanding how God's uh, work in the world relates to your work, and. I, would, I went back into business and found that I couldn't find very many people that wanted to talk to me about that. And so I would come back to Jubilee every year to get, my, to get pumped up. So go to Jubilee and get pumped up. Uh, and then we're, we're, the, the CCO is in an exciting season of life. We've, we're on 122 campuses. We're working with about 34,000 students every year. Uh, we're regional, or we were. We've been invited uh, initially, we were invited uh, to Brooklyn and then to Memphis. So we have a staff person in Brooklyn. We've got a staff person at the University of Kansas. Uh, we will have people starting in ministry in Memphis in the spring. Uh, we uh, will be in California. Uh, it looks like we'll probably be at Cal Berkeley of all the crazy places in the world, which means we're going to have a mass exodus of people working at Edinburgh to uh, go to Cal Berkeley. And, and, and so we've got, uh, and these are, this is all by invitation. We've learned, Vince has learned uh, in work that he's doing that we really do well going where we've been invited to work with students in partnership with the church. All that to say, if you're inclined to, to write us a check or make a donation between now and the end of the year, you know, we're in a place, organizations hit these stretches when you grow, you, you go through money. Uh, we're great stewards of the money that's given to us, but we're going to need supporters um, to pull this off. That's awesome. Well, can we just give Dan and Andrew a little Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to our question and answer with Dan. We really hope you enjoyed it. You can find ways to connect with Dan and the CCO and purchase a copy of Dan's book at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 125. Again, if you didn't get a chance to listen to Dan's talk from our breakfast, I really encourage you to go back to episode number 124. Uh, he talked about building organizational culture and it was fantastic. If you want to stay in touch with L3 and learn more about what we're doing, uh, you can go to our website at l3leadership.org and sign up for our email list and you'll also get a free copy of my ebook, Making the Most of Mentoring, uh, which is my step-by-step -step process for getting meetings with mentors. I really think it'll add value to your life. And we would really love for you to get more involved with our community. And the best way for you to do that would be to join a mastermind group. If you're unfamiliar with mastermind groups, um, I do a live webinar every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time um, where I teach you what a mastermind group is, how you can join one, and how you can even launch one if you wanted to launch one. So you can learn more about L3 Leadership Mastermind Groups at l3leadership.org forward slash mastermind. I want to thank our other sponsor, 068, a company led by my friend Daniel Bull. And 068 is a company that actually starts companies with ex-convicts, which is amazing. And uh, they've started, I believe, 12 or 13 companies at this point um, with ex-convicts, and they're just doing amazing work. And you can see their transformational work at 068.org. That's all spelled out. That's 068.org. Uh, again, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, I'd really appreciate if you would subscribe and leave a rating and review on iTunes or whatever you use to listen to this podcast. It really does make a difference. Thanks again for being a listener. We don't take that for granted. And as always, I like to close with a quote. And I love this quote I read recently from Gandhi. He said this. He said, the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. I love that. And um, that's one reason I'm passionate about L3 Leadership is hopefully we help people bridge that gap between what they do and what they're capable of doing um, through personal growth. So thanks again for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. My wife, Laura, and I appreciate you so much, and we hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you ha next episode.